Are we ready to come back, community action? If you can hear me, clap once. If you can hear me, clap twice. If you can't wait for to this week and the excitement that's going to happen, clap three times. All right, that I, I yeah, we fumbled the ball on that. All right, all right, let's bring it in, community action. Woo! All right, the legislative update. I will say it did feel good earlier today to pray for CSBG reauthorization publicly because <laughs> we've been praying for it personally for a long time. Before we get rolling with David, we want to say thank you to another one of our gold sponsors. Over the last two years or so, we've rolled out a partnership with Amazon Business that has given community action agencies opportunities to save more dollars. And when you can save dollars on that side of the ledger, you can put them on the mission side of the ledger. So I am pleased to welcome Jackie Cavanaugh, who we've been working with since day one on this stuff, uh, to the stage. Thank you, Jackie. Hi, everyone. It was, um, it was unclear to me if my speaking engagement was going to be just following Mr. Robinson or if there was going to be a buffer. And I'm just, I'm grateful for the 10 minute buffer so that you all can recalibrate your expectations for what a <laughs> mediocre uh, keynote speaking engagement is. Um, well, thank you, Denise. I'm Jackie Cavanaugh. I'm a, um, the co-founder and senior sales manager for Amazon Business in the nonprofit vertical. I've been with Amazon Business for a little over five years, um, supporting the nonprofit vertical for two of the five. To start, I do just want to say thank you to Denise Harlow and Javita, Javita Talbert for hours and hours of uh, preparation to allow this collaborative event to happen. I'd also like to take a minute to thank all of the community action agencies who have dedicated time in the last 12 months to establishing deeply rooted strategic relationships with Amazon Business in our formative years of serving agencies. The insights that you have all shared regarding how we can better serve you as a vendor, equipping you to deliver your mission are invaluable, so thank you. Amazon Business for Nonprofits strives to offer all of the goods that nonprofit organizations need to operate their facilities and fulfill their mission by leveraging our 30 plus years of e-commerce experience to save time, money, and allow you to focus on serving your communities. There were a handful of really exciting breakthroughs with our relationship with NCAP members in 2022 which included the launch of the Amazon Business NCAP Associated Account Program, which essentially allows agencies to link their Amazon Business account to NCAP endorsed benefits, um, including discounts on Amazon private brands office supplies, which includes $35 copy paper, which I'm not really an expert or a connoisseur in office supplies, but I've been, heard, I've, I've been told that that's a very competitive price. The feedback from that is overwhelmingly positive. Deeper discounts on nonprofit business prime subscriptions in addition to the newly launched education and nonprofit discount price point on over 10,000 commonly purchased items for classroom and early childhood education facilities. In addition to launching the associated account program, we also extended our first set pricing agreement with LIHEAP agencies in the state of Washington. This included setting ceiling prices on 10 frequently purchased AC units that were being distributed to qualifying families. This pricing, coupled with our multiple ship to address upload tool, made purchasing AC units for hundreds of families at scale a streamlined process. One of my team members, Pete Warrensoff, who's here today, worked with a Washington-based agency that was desperately seeking portable AC units as temperatures reached unbearable levels this summer for their most vulnerable population. In emergencies, as you know, sometimes funds aren't available, and we were able to secure quick approvals to increase their Amazon business credit limit to secure AC units from a third-party supplier. This is just one of the many examples about how Amazon business can help. In the nonprofit vertical, we have four customer advisors dedicated to community action agencies. I would strongly encourage you to visit uh, Pete Warrensoff, Sydney Zeller, Atiba Phillip, and Nick Ferrucci in booth 502. It's next to the merch tent. 
I am the proud owner of a mystery box. I don't know if anyone had the opportunity to purchase a mystery box from the merch tent yet, but it was a, a thrilling experience. They have more left. Um, they're hosting a raffle at the Amazon tent for an Amazon Fire tablet in exchange for voice of customer feedback around procurement challenges for Head Start and LIHEAP agencies. If you're an NCAP member, they'll link your Amazon business account on the spot to unlock your exclusive savings. And if you're new to Amazon business, they'll walk you through the registration process. Thank you so much for letting us join your event and for the time, Denise. Nice meeting you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jackie. There are several of those mystery bags left just for you. All right, spin the wheel. We took, we asked people to raise their hands earlier, David, how many people here were the first time and a vast, a large number of folks in the room, first time. So I wanna make sure I read David's bio so you understand a little bit. You won't be able to get at all in these few paragraphs, but what David Bradley has meant to this network and means to this day as we fight for CSBG reauthorization. For more than 30 years, David Bradley has been one of Washington's leading advocates on behalf of low-income programs. In 1981, David helped found the National Community Action Foundation as a private nonprofit organization funded solely by non-governmental contributions, and CAF represents significant funding and policy interests of the nation's 1,000 local community action agencies, you. He represents all of us before Congress, and the executive branch. He currently acts as NCAF's certainly chief executive officer. He was the primary architect of the community services block grant. He also focuses his attention on weatherization, LIHEAP, and a range of other programs because he's on the Hill every day doing what? Saying community action, helping people changing lives. Community action is the accountable receiver of federal, state, local dollars. We produce results every day and we're fighting to end poverty. David Bradley is our voice on the Hill. Whatever we can do in this room to support David, I encourage you to do so. David, thank you so much for making the trip to the city. We welcome your remarks. I realize I'm the, I'm the speaker between you and lunch, so uh, no pressure there. I see a clock flashing at me already. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to be here, and um, uh, thank you for this opportunity. And you know, how, uh, how appropriate it is that we're in New York City. Uh, without New York City, a number of institutions and a number of leaders, there wouldn't be a war on poverty. There wouldn't be community action. There wouldn't have been, in a lot of ways, a great society. And, and just if you take a, a, a broad look, a sweep, at organizations in New York that have made a difference from the 50s and 60s on in terms of this, you know, Bedford Stuy, the, the youth in action, now, important in terms of a forerunner for community action, CDCs, Harlem Youth Opportunities Unlimited, Mobilization for Youth, a forerunner of community action. The New York City Youth Board, the Central Brooklyn Coordinating Council, the Ford Foundation, President's Committee on Juvenile Delinquency. All of those have roots here in New York. And names, some are familiar and some are not so familiar. Some we've forgotten and some we should never forget. But Elsie Richardson, it was with the Central Bro uh, Brooklyn Coordinating Council, a real pioneer, a real pioneer uh, in terms of equality, inclusion, community uh, engagement. Shirley Chisholm, Mayor Robert Wagner, and there's two Robert Wagners in terms of friend and, and uh, critic. Charlie Rangel, John Lindsay, Jacob Javits, Adam Clayton Powell. Without Adam Clayton Powell, there wouldn't have been a great society. There wouldn't have been a war on poverty. And without his chairmanship of Ed and Labor, just so much of this country would have been, uh, you know, much less productive and much less positive. And I always think of Robert Kennedy. 
Nelson Rockefeller. So New York is important in our, in our, in our history and, and uh, it's an amazing city that's made a huge difference. I want to talk to you about, uh, about the state of where we're at, but before I do that, it's important to also thank the network. And I, I always usually leave that until the end, then, then I get a notice saying you got <clears throat> your three minutes over, see ya. So I want to do that at the beginning. And in thanking the network, it's thanking our federal uh, allies, our friends, OCS, DOE, not that we agree with everything they're doing or, or wish that they wouldn't, wouldn't hurry up on certain things, but what a wonderful, wonderful team in place at both HHS and DOE in terms of our behalf. Thanks to all the national partners. Thanks to the states. Thanks to the state associations, particularly recently. But most importantly, thanks to the CAPS, thanks to the network. You know, the last, last two years have been, two and a half years have been really, really difficult for everyone. But I've never been more proud of this network, that the work that we've done uh, throughout the country on a variety of things uh, on, on the recent 24 to 30 months, it's gonna make a difference as I'll tell you about. So thank you, thank you to the, uh, to the network. Let me talk a little bit about the environment we're in today in Washington. And it, it reflects a lot of what you see in the community. And, and the fact that, that I'm talking about it doesn't mean that Washington's more important than what you do in your community. But it just happens to be my perspective on the world I operate in. And as one who likes Congress, who wants, wants government to work, believes in a positive role for government, um, it's a frustrating time. And in so many ways, it's surreal. You keep waking up thinking, well, it was a dream. Life will get better today. And yet it seems like every day or every week, something, something, uh, again, is another log on the fire that makes it difficult for, for Washington to function. So I want to talk a little bit about, if we never see each other between now and, say, the end of the year, I want to talk about the environment, what we're dealing with, and then where we're at specifically on issues that we're engaged in. I uh, only have time to mention a few. Most importantly is what we all have to do together and what the next two or three months mean for not only our network, but perhaps for the country as well. So let me start first with the political environment. You, you want Congress to work, you want Washington to get along, you want, you want society to be civil and to engage on solving our problems. That environment doesn't exist. It just doesn't. And, and I'm used to hard fighting politically, but the hatred, the animosity, the toxicity is something that is, is quite unusual and quite destructive. And it's not only one party uh, at fault, it's both. It's a party, it's an environment in which, in which each side views politics as warfare, as a blood sport. And everything they're doing is gained and, gained and gamed toward the November elections. I don't know a member of Congress that's happy right now. And that troubles me deeply. They don't enjoy their job, and if people don't enjoy the job, what I'm worried about is the good members say, I don't need this anymore. Well, our country needs good people in Congress. And there's some that want to do the right thing, but they're not able to. So it's an environment in which, in which both parties are comfortable with not getting a lot done. I'm not talking about the big bills on you know, inflation reduction and things like that but a lot of other things, a lot of other business that America needs to be met. They're prepared to kick it down the road and just say, wait afterwards, because they're looking at November and what it means and who's gonna control the House and the Senate. As of right now, I, I, th I think the Democrats will, will gain seats in the Senate, one or two. Yeah. 
What state are you in? <laughs> California means nothing, but other than that, uh, doesn't help me out, out at all in talking about politics. Um, the, uh, except I know who wants to take Feinstein's place on the Democratic side. Um, but I, th I think they're likely to gain one or two. And it's not because Democrats are necessarily <laughs> uh, overselling. It's that Republicans are grossly underperforming in terms of some of their candidates. On the House, the, um, you know, it's up in the air. I still think Republicans retain control. If you look at just simply how many seats they need to pick up, but it's going to be by a narrow margin. It was 25 to 35 was the comfortable range. Now it's maybe 10 to 15. So Congress is going to stay divided. And I ask people, what's going to unite us? You know, I used to, and members of Congress, I ask all the time, A, are you happy? And B, what's going to unite us? What's going to bring us together again? I used to think a 9-11 event. God forbid, particularly here in New York City, but would another 9-11 event unite the country? And the answers come back too often, no. So the election may not unite us. It may not allow Congress to heal because on November 9th, the day after, happens to be Shriver's birthday, by the way, on November 9th, uh, on November 9th, the race is on for 2024. So if we never see each other again this year, watch the margin in the House and then the repercussions. If Kevin McCarthy and Republicans take control of the House, but by a narrow margin, governing is going to be almost impossible. Democrats will oppose a Republican agenda, and McCarthy is going to have to unite the Republicans, which means the Freedom Caucus is going to drive the agenda. If Democrats hold on by one or two or three, which I don't think is likely, but if they do, governing is going to be very difficult on their behalf because they won't get any Republican support. So it's, it's, it, the next few months and perhaps the next two years are going to be difficult, all because of politics. And 2024 looms large in both the Republican and Democratic side. So that's the world that we find ourselves in, political, angry, toxic, and in warfare. What we want to do, and what our goal has always been, is we want to be the good guys. We want both parties to feel comfortable supporting us. We want both parties to embrace what we're doing, the positive work we're doing in communities. And I think there is a role for that, and I think there's a path forward. So accepting there's a lot of big issues out there that we can't control, but accepting that, the environment, here's how we're trying to navigate it. So I want to go through a quick, quick list of things that we're talking, the things that we're working on. Number, number one, appropriations. I get a lot of calls on, on are we going to be on a continuing resolution, what's going to happen with the 200 percent, and what's going to be the ultimate funding level. Um, and then people say, well, but the Office of Community Services is saying that the 200% goes away on September 30th. All of that's correct. But let me explain the environment. Number one, the House has, has moved half of their appropriation bills. The other half can't get through the House floor. But they're all out of committee. The Senate hasn't started moving any of their appropriation bills, so we will be on a continuing resolution as we have been for the last two years. Congress has had to pass CRs. So the burden is on us to make sure that whatever period we're on, on, the, on uh, a CR, the 200% is in there. And we've succeeded on that. The one thing I haven't succeeded on is I want the word shall rather than may in terms of state requirement on 200%. Most of your states do 200% eligibility. There's a couple that don't. They can't get it. They won't do it. They'll go, they'll go, they'll go uh, may, but they won't, so far they won't go shall. So number one, we're going to extend 200% the way we have in the past. 
And two, our funding level between the House and whatever the Senate proposes will be significant. On CSPG, there will be differences. We've got issues on all the way up and down the line, particularly on Labor H. CSPG, we have to get it as high as possible in this go-round because we've got an ambitious agenda on reauthorization, including a formal adjustment for the small states with a trigger. So we want to go as high as we can. And, and um, our goal is $800 million, perhaps a little bit more if we can get it, because we're going to need around $950 million to make a massive formula change that protects everyone and increases the pot for everyone. There's a plan. So we have number one, we're going to have a CR for at least one, perhaps two continuing resolutions. The question, the question on CRs, before I talk about energy and water, the questions on CRs, is Congress going to finish the work, this Congress, finish the appropriation bills, or are they going to have to wait until a new Congress comes in? There's two trains of thought. Number one is that they finish all the work. They finish 22 appropriations, 23 appropriations rather. They finish all of that so they can start fresh, particularly if Republicans take control of the House. And what drives part of that feeling that eh, that's the likelihood of coming, uh, of, of the outcome, is that there's going to be a number of new members in Congress, likely Republicans, who really don't believe in government and are likely to vote against appropriation bills, budget, debt ceiling, and CRs. So finish all the work you can now, plus deal with the controversial issues. You know, the writers, Roe v. Wade, things that are really controversial. Deal with the tough votes now. Give them a break when they come in. So there is that. But on the other hand, there's a, there's a, there's a force, a group, saying, why do we compromise now, particularly if we're in the majority? So they're saying, now we're going we're gonna to kick this over to next year where we have more leverage. But I think with Shelby, a Republican of Alabama, retiring, Pat, ranking on a probe, Senator Probes, Leahy retiring, I think that there is a drive to get appropriations done. So we're going to have some work to do. We're gonna have, we need more money in Leahy. Head Start, we've got to make sure it's taken care of. We need absolutely to protect House and Senate levels on weatherization. If possible, we need to get this readiness fund far above $30 million. And we've got other changes that we need. So appropriations <coughs> post midterms are going to be a busy time. So in September, watch what length is. Watch the rhetoric out there. But also uh, on November 9th, wake up, see what Congress is talking about, how they're going to finish out the year. Second, CSPG reauthorization. Um, it is extensive, intensive, and probably the most complicated uh, undertaking I've ever had in my professional life. When we started in the House, <laughs> 2013, but when we started this Congress, the impression by House Democrats, leadership as well as leadership on Ed and Labor is, we can't win on this. We can't get this passed. We can't win, and we won't have any bipartisanship. That was the environment we faced, to convince them that if you gave us a chance, we could win. Continuing to downplay support for the program. And you know this. Some of you run across this. Everyone discounts the broad support, or underestimates is a better word, the broad support for this program. They always do. And they always say, boy, I, my, my caps in my district are great, but it's all the others. They always discount popular support. So for a lot of reasons, including what I think will be a very difficult appropriations uh, environment next year and the year after, it was important to show strong bipartisan support. So we got a bill. We got a bill through the, through the House, 246 to 
169 or 165. We had 30 Republicans to vote for it. We would have had 100 Republicans. And that's not a number out of thin air. We would have had 100 Republicans, except there's an issue called charitable choice that's in our bill. It's in a lot of bills. And I want to take one minute and tell you what charitable choice is because it is central to our story in the Senate. Charitable choice refers to rules that allow religious organizations to participate in social services and federal programs. It allows such organizations that when they participate and receive federal funds that they can remain independent, retain their religious character and, as, and their religious affiliations, and as long as they don't use federal money for secular purposes and the funds stay segregated, you know, they can, they can maintain their religious character and conduct secretarian, sectarian activities, but not with federal funds. Democrats see this as a civil rights issue. You know, you can discriminate on employment. They see it as a civil rights issue. Republicans see this as a religious liberty issue. And look at all the Supreme Court cases. So here we are with charitable choice, which had virtually no impact in the program, central to our story on passing this. Without, and we repealed charitable choice, our current language, which has had no impact. Without that repeal, we would have had, I believe, I'm pretty confident of it, over 100 Republicans. So we satisfied the skeptics, but we still have the politics. Now we're over on the Senate. And just so you know, there's two offers on the table. Uh, we've got to get the help committee to do what they don't want to do. And what they're asking, the question that they're asking is, why should we do this? Not how can we do this, which is what the House was asking. But what the Senate's asking is, why should we do this? Why do we need to do this? Well, uh, Republicans, the good news is Republicans on the committee, with three or four exceptions, and you can look over a list and pick out who they are. And it's a badge of honor if they oppose you. It really is. Um, you can look at that and you say, well, uh, with the exception of if we kept current law on, CSP, on charitable choice and we knocked out voter registration, they would agree to everything else. 10-year authorization, billion dollars, formal adjustment, 200% permanent, broadband, timely disbursement of money from feds to the states, states local, everything, uh, innovation fund, everything else we want. They will sign off on, they say, we can we'll get you 60 votes uh, at a minimum, we can pass it in three weeks. So the question becomes, will the Senate Democrats, one in particular, will they say, it's not worth making this fight on charitable choice, we can't win it, let's capture the good of, of everything else in the bill. That's where we're at now. So one of two things is likely to happen in September and beyond of critical months. Number one is um, we could introduce a companion bill to the House. I know who I want to introduce it. A companion bill to the House that, that keeps current law, current law and charitable choice, knocks out voter registration, but has everything else in it. Introduce that. Or second, and then work momentum on that. Or second, we could then possibly step back and amend current law on CSBG, picking up all the things that we want that were contained in 5129. So September is when this strategy works. And members, and we were, we were talking as I walked into a few people, members are very comfortable, House and Senate, saying, you know, I love this program. Boy, I want to help you. Uh, and, you know, I'm going to be there for you, but you got to talk to so-and-so, passing the buck. Well, you know what? It's showtime. And everybody involved in our program, we're going to step up higher, and we're going to expect more out of Congress on that. So watch what develops one of those two streams um, in an environment in which the Senate is absolutely gridlocked, partisan-wise. We have a strategy for November and December that is our best option. House Democrats are comfortable with our strategy. 
House Republicans are comfortable, most of them, with our uh, Senate strategy now. Let's see if we can do it. But, but to be successful, you have to be involved. So you're going to see a lot of things coming to us, coming to you, explaining what we're doing. Finally, let me talk very, very quickly about weatherization. You know, um, it's a golden moment for weatherization, and yet it's also a frightening moment. We've got, we've got a program that started in six weeks. Man, do we have needs. We've got things that have to be corrected. You know, you can't hire at eight, uh, when the cost per unit is $8,000, $8,009. It ought to be tripled, the average cost per unit. And let alone, you know, we've got $12,000 in the bill. So number one, we've got, we've got, um, Good progress on appropriations for FY23, energy and water, both Republicans and Democrats alike, good progress on that. But we also have needs, regulatory and legislative, in Congress to get, to get done. And you've heard about the Reed bill, you've heard about the Tonko bill, but let me put a couple things in, in perspective. On the, um, our issues that we have spent a lot of time on, particularly most recently in August with a lot of, a couple members, but a lot of uh, uh, energy staff, both approach and authorization. You know, here's the issues confronting us. We've got the readiness fund, which needs to be authorized. You know, uh, we need to end a lot of the paperwork. We've got, we've got annual appropriations on the readiness fund. So we need to authorize it, and then we need to make sure we fund it, but fund it adequately. You know, it's 15 million now, it's 30, and these appropriation bills, that has to be at least 90. DOE has work to do, and they're our friends, and OCS is our friends, we like them, but they've got work to do. We can't, we can't have regulations finalized or even put out for comments a year and a half from now or a year from now. The program won't wait. There will be a bullseye on our back if we don't launch this in a flawless way. Uh, you know, the standards, the, the uh, uh, standard packages have been simplified. That's positive. Um, the simplified credentials uh, for, for workers, making progress on that. Um, but the regulatory changes and the appropriations, the legislative changes, all need to be done, accelerated, this Congress. So pressure needs to be applied to DOE, but pressure needs to be applied to Congress to do their work. In August, I spent time on, on House approaches and, and authorizing, and every, either chief of staff or ledge director, members, House members were out, kept saying, we're on, we'll co-sponsor after the midterm elections. We're down to three or four weeks after the midterm elections. So you're going you're gonna to see a lot of activity by us. We need you to engage convincing Congress to do their job. You can't invest $3.5 billion. You can't take advantage of up to you know, $9 billion or $90 billion in, in other funding through DOE without getting this program right. So we're going to accelerate uh, uh, some of the pressure. So Reed and Tonko and Rush and Captor and others are going to have to do their work. Let me end with just a couple of things. You know, years ago, um, there was a commercial that was um, one of my favorites that was, was very, very popular at the time, and it was on Dosecki Beer. And bet you didn't think I'd be saying that, right? Uh, Bradley Dusecki beer. But it was the most interesting man in the world commercial. Some of you may remember those. As one person who's recognized as one of the least interesting persons uh, on the planet, uh, you wonder how I'm going to approach this. But the commercial was, was highly effective. And at the end, he looked in, he looked in a... Um, um, directly at the camera, and he said, stay thirsty, my friends. That was his last words. To you, I want to say, 
Stay committed, my friends. Stay committed in excellence. As good as we are, aim higher. Be as good as we can be. Stay committed to social change. In America, we know it's not perfect. This, this road to a more perfect union is long and hard and complicated. But we can play our role. Stay committed to civility. I, I, think, I think that we have a chance to change the tenor of policy discussions in America. I truly do. I think I said, you know, we're the good guys or the good men or women. We can do that. Stay committed to civility. But also, most importantly, stay committed to the purpose of community action, what it's all about. Our story in the last two years has been astounding. You know, we're, you, you hear at this conference, oh, we've spent 82% of CARES Act, and we're proud, NCAP's proud of getting a billion dollars for the network. We really are. That was three, three weeks that I look back, and man, that was, it was fun. Don't want to do it again, but it was fun. <laughs> and, we're, and we've spent 82%. And you'll, you'll hear people say, well, yeah, we've got to get to 95, 99, or 100. We're not going to get at that level. We've got one month left of a 30-month program. To spend 18%, not going to happen. But success to me, and let me get, let you in on a secret, success to Congress is anything over 90%. So can oh, we get an God. extra seven or eight percent? Absolutely. Um, oh no, I can't. So that is, I don't want to like stay committed to excellence, performance, social change, the purpose of community action. You know, we've 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 done a lot. In America in the last two years, it seems like we've taken a big in fact the world taken a big step back. You know, politically on all the major issues, social, economic, environmental issues. We've never been in a more complicated environment. Historians think 1945 is the most complicated year for the world and for our country. I think the time we're in now is the most complicated, and one of the most difficult and one of the most consequential. But when, when historians look back 20 or 30 years from now at this time, and they happen to take a look at community action, and they ask the question, did you keep your commitment to excellence? We answer, we did. If they ask the question, did you keep your commitment to social change, and are you still committed to social change? We answer, we are. If they answer, did you do it in a civil way? Did you keep your commitment to be civil? We say, we do. Did you live up to the purpose of community action? We say we have. If we can all do that together, and if we can dig deeper inside for that little extra effort that we need to get us over the finish line in the next few months, then at some point in the not too distant future, I promise you that we're gonna be able to say collectively, we won. That's what this is all about. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Who's our man on the hill? David. Woo. CSBG reauthorization, million dollars of CARES, leading community action. So David, thank you so much for your commitment to community action. Thank you for your inspirational words today. We appreciate your partnership at NCAF and for getting us started here today. All right, folks. Lunch is on your own, except for those of you going to the seat cap lunch, which is a ticket, uh, woohoo, which is a ticketed event. We'll start up the workshops at two o'clock. Plenty of places, I think, out there to get some to eat today. So we'll see you at two o'clock. Thanks, everybody.